Let's start off by talking about food. What is your favorite food? My favorite food will be Thai curry. I think that'll always top my list. But I also like all kinds of Asian cuisines. I like Vietnamese food. They've got a soup called pho, and I also like Korean food. I don't know how they've come up come up with kimchi. I really feel like uh, it just blows my mind, and it really ignites a lot of uh, taste buds. <laughs> so yeah, all kinds of Asian cu- cuisines, and I also like Indian cuisine as well. Do you like to eat out or stay in and cook? I think stay in and cook because I like to consider myself a decent cook. I think I can pre- prepare a basic decent meals and sometimes when I go out I end up comparing it with mine. So I like to eat at home because uh, uh, yeah, I feel like sometimes maybe my food is tasting better than the outside food. What was your favorite food when you were a child? This is a very basic meal in India. It's called kichri. It is a porridge in India, which is made with rice and dal, which is lentils, and it is very basic. There's no fancy uh, ingredient involved in it. It's just rice and dal, and a bit of uh, ghee and uh, just some basic spices. It's my comfort food and to-go food for me. Yes. Are there any foods you would like to try in the future? I don't know, but I haven't been to South America, so I don't know how a Peruvian meal would taste like. I've tasted Mexican, I've tasted Italian, I've tasted all kinds of Chinese, Vietnamese, and Asian food, but I've never tasted South American food. So I think I would like to try the food from there. Now let's talk about holidays. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite holiday destination? My favorite holiday destination would be Bali. I think I've been to Bali a couple of times, and I'm a very tropical person. I enjoy the heat, and I also enjoy the humid, <laughs> if I can say that. And uh, Bali, by far, has impressed me the most. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's my favorite destination, I guess. What is your dream holiday destination, maybe in in the future? I would say Peru or Peru, um, because. There was a time in my life I booked the tickets and then COVID happened mm-hmm. and unfortunately I couldn't go to the uh, place so I booked a ticket for Brazil and then from there ahead to Peru. So uh, yeah, that's still on my bucket list. Where would you recommend going on holiday in your home country? Where? Mm-hmm. Mm, Ladakh. It's called the heaven on earth. Even Kerala is called the heaven on earth. I've been to both places. But I feel for me, uh, Ladakh tops the list, and it is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. You get to see a lot of different terrains. You get to see the mountains, snow-capped mountains. You also get to see the Rocky Mountains. You also get to see the greenery. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Do you prefer a city holiday or a holiday in nature? For me personally, holiday in nature, because. Um, I'm more inclined towards the nature because it grounds me, also mentally stabilizes me and makes me feel really calm and relaxed. So I would always prefer nature over the cities. I feel cities really consume a lot of energy out of you when you are like surrounded by so many people. Now let's talk about drinks. What do you normally drink with breakfast? So I don't think I'm heavy on drinks in the sense I drink basic water. And especially with breakfast, I don't have milk or oh, I I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm very heavy on tea. My morning has to start with tea, and uh, it's the basic masala chai from India. So that's what I drink. Yes. Do you think you drink enough water each day? Yes, I do. I try and drink about two to three liters of water every single day. If people visit your home for dinner, what do you normally offer them to drink? So. Usually in India, we'd like to say, "Would you want to have hot drink or cold drink?" So hot drink usually means tea and coffee, tea or coffee, and cold drinks mean uh, any kind of soft drink, which is Coca Cola, Fanta, Limca. These are the drinks which are normally offered in India. Mm-hmm. So yes, that I'd probably offer that, or probably something fancy like uh, a lemonade or something like that. Now let's talk about maps. Do you ever use maps on your phone? Oh yes, all the time. I think maps have made our lives easier, and uh, to travel from one place to the other, I always need my map. And in fact, even when I'm going on a walk or a run, I always have the map on my hand, so I can just 
generally wander around and get lost and not worry about it. When you visit a new city, do you prefer to use a map or find your own way around? Both. So I usually have, for the larger picture of it, I usually have the map and I like to download the offline map. And uh, But within that uh, system, within that uh, window, I also like to just explore and move around and get lost, like I said, yes. Do you find it easy to follow a map when driving? Oh, yes. Like I said, Google Maps have made it so much easier for us. So it's usually normal for me. In fact, I think I am the navigator amongst my friends. I think I do have a knack for it. Like I do have, uh, I do understand the maps better than other friends of mine. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it says, describe a city you would like to visit. I've mentioned that I've already been to Bali, but I think that's one city I'd like to visit again. In fact, there was a point in my life I wanted to settle down in Bali. So Bali will be my uh, top priority. And uh, I would like to go there. And I think the easiest mode to travel to Bali is uh, flight. And uh, the reason I like Bali is because, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a tropical person. And the weather is very suitable for my kind of a person who comes from India. And... Uh, also, I think Bali is very beautiful. It's surrounded by beaches, nature, rice paddy fields, which is what I love about Bali because you can just uh, travel from one area to the other and every specific area is beautiful in its own, on its own. And um, what I also really enjoy and like about Bali is the food. It's very vegan friendly. I'm a vegan and I don't have to uh, stress much when I'm trying to find vegan food over there. And it's also yummy it's also tasty so that's also one of the reasons I've uh, fallen in love with Bali and um, it's also big on yoga <laughs> I forgot to mention that I think the first time I went to Bali was on a retreat a yoga retreat which I was attending and then I think it's one of my dreams to go to Bali again to hold a retreat since I'm a yoga teacher and if given a chance to stay in Bali or probably probably move to Bali, that'll be the best dream life to have a yoga studio teach over there and also probably have a small cafe which can offer vegan food. And I think topping everything, top of the list would be Bali is very cheap to live and also to travel. Like, you know, you don't have to burn your pocket to, in, in fact, enjoy the entire country or city. So, yeah, Bali would always top my list to visit. So you were telling me about a city that you would like to visit, um, and we'll continue to talk about visiting cities on holiday. Mm -hmm. Why do some people prefer to visit a city mm -hmm. on holiday? To thank you for watching this video, I want to give you a free course that has helped thousands of students improve their IELTS speaking score. What it's going to do is take you through every single part of the test and give you strategies for part one, part two, and part three, and also allow you to practice at home for free and get feedback. To sign up for that for free, all you have to do is just click the link in the description. Thanks very much, and let's get back to the video. Okay, so if you mean to say city as opposed to a town or probably a countryside, then I think um, a lot of people, they prefer a crowded city because there are many things to do probably. They can go for a movie, they can shop a lot. So a lot of people like personally, I know my husband prefers a city over places which are full of nature and I'm the opposite. And the reason for that is that, for example, he loves London. So he can go and watch as many shows he likes. He can watch a movie and then he can move around and shop a lot. So I think that's why probably people prefer cities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it more expensive to go on holiday in a city? I think yes, because um, everything is commercialized. Even, for example, in London, there is a three-wheeler. Uh, it's called a tuk-tuk or a rickshaw in India. Similar to that, there's a three-wheeler, a uh, fancy three-wheeler in London uh, city centre. And I think you have to pay like a uh, hundred pounds just to like go from one place to the other with the music. So everything is commercialized to a level so much so that you really end up burning your pocket because every small thing you have to pay for it, even for, for example, water. So yeah, I think uh, being in a city will cost you a lot. Is it better to visit a city alone or with other people? I think it depends. It's both. 
a lot of people, they like to travel solo and a lot of people, they need to have people around them. For example, if you're going to watch a show, maybe if you are with somebody and you're watching a show, you'll enjoy it more because you have a company with you. For some people, they would prefer to be alone and watch it because they can probably consume or intake and really soak in the experience. So it depends. It's it's up to, it's very subjective, I guess. Now let's talk about the growth of cities. Why are the biggest cities in the world getting bigger? I think, like I mentioned, everything is commercialized and uh, you got to pay the prices, like even the bigger showrooms and stores. Uh, if you buy a certain item from like a smaller city, not the bigger ones I'm talking about, you'll end up paying lesser than what you'll pay probably in London London or New York. Mm-hmm. So that way is uh, one of the reasons is that, I guess. And also I think uh, moving around, like most of the people from smaller cities, they want to uh, uh, go into and uh, start living in bigger cities. So that's also one of the reasons that the, uh, the cost of living uh, starts to rise, yeah. What are the downsides of living in a mega city? Downside of living in a mega city would be A, the cost of living. Because the more the people, the higher the prices because you'll have to pay more rent because there's so much of demand for these places and supply is lesser. So that's one thing, cost of living. The second is uh, maybe you are a little bit out of touch from nature because it's like you're staying in a concrete jungle. You're surrounded by buildings. And also, uh, the more number of people, the lesser social in- interaction. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe you're, uh, you might just end up being a little lonely. <laughs> so I think some of the few downsides are like that. How will large cities in the future be different to how they are today? So as we can see that uh, we're advancing more and more uh, day by day and uh, things are just improving in a grand scale. So I think we'll become more advanced in future. And uh, like I mentioned, we lose touch uh, with, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, if I have to take a guess, we lose touch with humanity. Everything is going to become very robotic and very computer and machine based. I think that's what I see around, but I don't have a clear answer for that. Now let's talk about children in cities. Is it better to grow up in a city or the countryside? Again, I think I'm biased towards it because I feel I'm more inclined towards a countryside or living in a setup like that. So I feel that it'll be better to bring up or raise your children, raise your child in a countryside setup. A, because you are not bringing in chaos to them. I feel that the city life has a lot of chaos with it. And B, um, like, for example, I've always advocated that, you know, kids should be taught meditation. I think there's no bigger meditation than being around nature, you know, walking on grass. So you can teach them better things which people start advocating later in life. So you can teach all of that with homeschooling. So I think that's a very good option to really uh, venture into or take into consideration. What advantages do children brought up in the countryside have over children brought up in a city? Advantages, like I mentioned, uh, would be that maybe they're calmer than the city uh, children. I think the city children will be more technologically advanced, but might not have the same emotional bandwidth, maybe, and might not have the uh, mental capacity to really take in uh, stress because they'll always be consumed with stress around them. So I think the city, sorry, I'm missing uh, now the two kind of children. I think the the countryside children will be better at having that same mental capacity or a better mental capacity and emotional bandwidth to handle stress. So you're hoping to get a band nine and I have some some good news and some not so good news, but let's see if you're you're going to get a band nine and what you could do to improve to a band nine. So thank you for making it this far in the video. I want to give you 10% off our VIP course. The IELTS VIP course is the most successful IELTS course in the world. That is a fact because we have more band seven, eight, and nine success stories than any other IELTS course in the entire world. We do that by simplifying the whole IELTS process, supporting you with some of the best IELTS teachers in the world and being with you every step of the way until you get the score that you need. All you have to do is just look down in the description, just click that and you can sign up. If you have any questions about the VIP course, always feel free 
to get in touch with us. We answer 100% of the questions that we get. Hope that you have become a VIP. If not, enjoy the rest of this free video. So I'm gonna give you feedback on part one, part two, and part three. And then what I will do is I will give you uh, feedback on the four marking criteria. So fluency and coherence, pronunciation, grammar, and vocabulary. If you didn't get a band nine, we'll give you some areas for, for improvement. So part one is just normal, everyday questions. Most of your answers were, were very, very good. One thing that I would um, be careful about is listing lots of different things. So for example, we asked you about your favorite food and you're like, I like Thai, I like Vietnamese, I like this, da, 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 da. You don't do this, but what a lot of students do is when you ask them part one questions, they just list lots of different mm -hmm. things. And the problem with that is it doesn't give the examiner enough to really judge your grammar. So it's just like, I like, I like, I like present simple, present simple, present simple. You didn't do that for every answer, mm -hmm. but when you're under pressure on test day, it's kind of like a safety blanket where yeah. students are like, if you ask them anything, um, what do you do on the weekend? I like to read, go to the cinema, go to the park, go to the movie. Mm -hmm. So they just list lots of different things. The rest of your answers were very natural, well-developed. Just be careful about that on, right. on test day. Not a bad thing. I'm highlighting the, the, the more negative things, but overall your part one performance was very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, it was like talking to a work colleague or a friend. Um, it, was, it was excellent. Part two, the main worry that most students have with part two is having enough to talk about for the full two minutes. Mm -hmm. You have no problem Thought you could have talked about that for 10 <laughs> minutes, I think, or half an hour, no, no, no problem at all. You chose something which is very, very smart, which is picking a real scenario related to something that you really like. One thing that I would be a little bit careful about is the question says, describe a city you would like to visit. And you said, well, it's one that I visited in the past. Um, but I'm, I want to visit it in the future. So because you said that, that's no problem. Mm -hmm. No problem because you explained, I've been there in the past, I want to go there in the future. During the IELTS test, one thing the examiner will be thinking about is, are you using the appropriate tense to talk about this? So if you answered that question, like I went to Bali, here's why I really like Bali. Mm -hmm. Some examiners might be like, oh, she's basically saying that she doesn't know how to use future structures or talk about the future and mm -hmm. she's playing it very very safe you didn't do that but it's a risk right. so if you got a different topic on test day mm -hmm. a, a similar one always think about what tenses do they really want me to discuss here describe a city you would like to visit is normally a city you haven't been to so that would be more talking about conditionals hypotheticals using conditional language or something in the future, I would like to go somewhere I've never been. The other thing is it asks specifically about a city. Now, different countries have different interpretations of the word city. In some places, a city is a, a big built up area with at least millions of people in it, like London, Paris, New York. In other uh, cultures, in other places, a city is basically not the countryside. Bali, I don't know specifically whether <laughs> it is a, a, a island or mm. categorize it as an island or categorize it as a city. Mm. Some examiners, I don't, I'm not an expert on Bali, okay. all right, so <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. Now, if I was the examiner, I wouldn't care about mm. whether Bali is a city or, or whether it is an island because mm. it is a speaking test. We're right. judging your speaking. You talk very fluently and coherently about Bali, mm -hmm. but these little mistakes can't add up. So you listing lots of things in part one mm -hmm. and then talking about a place you've already been to that yeah. maybe is not a city technically. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All of these little things. So yeah. someone like you who's a very high level speaker mm -hmm can get their result and be like, oh, why did I not get the, the, the score that, that I'm looking for? So just be be careful with, mm -hmm. with that. Think about the question and think, am I using the correct grammatical structures and tenses? And am I answering this exactly? So mm -hmm. if it was like, is Bali a city? Why not just pick New York? 
right. or Doha right. or, or like somewhere. I know you've been to Doha many mm-hmm. times. Just be careful with that in, in part two. Part three, um, there were a f- couple of questions that, again, the IELTS test is not an ideas test. It is not a knowledge test. But there were a couple of questions where you were trying to think of the correct idea because you weren't 100% sure. During the, the part, part three of the test, what the examiner will do is they will ask you more and more difficult questions if they think you're good. So if they don't think that you're very good, they'll just ask you simple questions and mm-hmm. end the test. These questions like how will large cities in the future be different to how they are today? These are difficult questions conceptually. The ideas are difficult. Mm-hmm. And it's difficult to talk about them in a foreign language as well because you, you're using all sorts of future structures and comparing comparatives and things like that. In that situation, what most students do is start off and go, um, I don't know, I have no idea. Or they'll be like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it, this is the end of the test mm-hmm. and most people are tired. Mm-hmm. They just want it to be over. So they'll give very short unsatisfactory answers Mm -hmm. you actually despite not knowing a lot about this topic you gave a guess you gave some kind of an answer Mm -hmm. which is a plus point which is a good thing so don't worry too much about about that let's move on to uh, your scores for fluency and coherence Mm -hmm. coherence is answering the question because you did quite a, a bit of listing in some in part one. You struggled with a few of the questions in part three, and we're, we're not sure whether Bali is is, <laughs> is, is a city or not. Um, some examiners would give you wouldn't give you the top mark for that. Mm-hmm. The way that fluency and coherence works is it's in one band, mm-hmm. and whichever is lowest, that's your score. So if you're band nine for fluency but band eight for coherence, you get a band eight. All right. I think your fluency mm-hmm. is at a band nine, but I think because those little problems would add up, you probably get would get a band eight for coherence. So overall, mm-hmm. fluency and coherence, you probably get a band eight. But it is very fixable. Don't list stuff in part one. Develop your answers. Pick one thing. Like I love the pho because it has a really deep flavor and uh, and it's quite rare to get it. Blah 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 blah. You know. So instead of listing stuff, to pick one thing or two things and, and develop them. Mm-hmm. As I said before, be careful with your part twos. Mm-hmm. Make sure you're answering the question. Some people would say, well, she didn't answer the, the, the question. Pro-. I think it's debatable whether you answered the question, as I've already said. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't give you a really low score, mm-hmm. um, but I just would be, be careful with that. Okay. And again, if you get a difficult question in part three, do what you did, which is at, at least it attempted. Pronunciation, I think, is your strongest point. Mm-hmm. Um, the examiner will be thinking two, by two things. Number one, can they understand 100% of what you're saying? Mm-hmm. I can understand 100% of what you're saying. No problem at all. Mm-hmm. Second thing is they'll be thinking about higher level um, pronunciation features such as intonation, your voice going up, your voice going down. Mm-hmm. Um, your intonation is excellent. It helps you convey meaning. You sound friendly. You sound polite. And Often we do that through intonation. Mm -hmm. So if I said, please sit down, sound very rude. Mm -hmm. Please sit down, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it sounds very polite. So intonation can convey meaning and you do a very good job with that. Same with um, word stress and sentence stress. So Mm -hmm. word stress, um, for example, is I love this iPhone. You know, so I'm emphasizing the word love. Mm -hmm. But if I said, I love this iPhone, (laughs) <laughs> that means you don't love it, but I love it. Mm-hmm. So you you use word stress, sentence stress very, very effectively. Um, and you also use connected speech. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying, do you want to go to the cinema? Mm-hmm. That you don't pronounce every word, but like, do you want to go to the cinema? Mm-hmm. You know, so you connect the words and the signs together. You do a very good job. So you would get a band nine um, for pronunciation. Some people would say, um, who aren't examiners that don't know, oh, she's got an Indian accent. Mm-hmm. So you're not being judged on which accent you have. You, you don't get higher marks for sounding British or American or Australian or Irish. Um, you get extra marks for the clarity of your 
words and your communication. So it doesn't matter what accent you have. You would get a band nine, no problem at all. Grammar. So this is the area that I think that you need to work on the most. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show some sentences mm -hmm. and we're going to figure out what your, your um, grammar problems might okay. be. Okay. So as you can see, sometimes you make little slips with articles. Okay. So articles are words like a and mm -hmm. the, and sometimes, when you're, especially when you're thinking right. a lot about the answer, so those questions that you weren't that sure of, mm -hmm. the way I explain it to people is your brain is like a computer, mm -hmm. and if you have too many programs open at the same time, they, uh, they can slow down. Mm -hmm. So if you're really thinking about AI in the future and cities and that part of your brain is working very hard, mm -hmm. the part of your brain dealing with grammar and articles can slip a little bit. Overall, your grammar um, is very good, mm -hmm. um, but you are making those little, little mistakes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not huge errors that cause problems for the listener. Mm -hmm. So those are... Uh, big catastrophic errors that the, the listeners like what did she say i have no idea what mm -hmm. little slips like you made here mm -hmm. don't stop me understanding you but you're making a few too many of them okay. to get one of the higher <laughs> higher bands so you would get a band eight for mm -hmm. grammar because the vast majority of your sentences are error free mm -hmm. but sometimes you're making these little slips and they're mm -hmm. just a, a little bit too frequent to get mm -hmm. one of the one of the higher bands. Your vocabulary, there's some excellent topic specific vocabulary that you're using and some idiomatic vocabulary such as this. But sometimes you're using less precise phrases, idioms such as this. And as we can see here, you're sometimes repeating that a little bit too much. Um, so again, we wouldn't be giving you one of the, the very, very high bands. The vast majority of your sentences, mm -hmm. very high level vocabulary as we've seen, very precise, but there are just a few too many of these little slips mm -hmm. to get one of the, the higher bands. So you, again, you get a band eight mm -hmm. for vocabulary. So you're nearly there, <laughs> <laughs> you're nearly there. And what I would like to do is invite you back okay. and we can do another one. If you work on those little mistakes, Mm -hmm. We can do another one and see if you improve to about nine. Okay, perfect. Okay, right, good. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>